Hi. Um, I, I prayed about this, but whether or not I should share this, and I, I really felt God leading me to share this. And I can't call this a dream because I didn't have it while I was asleep. And I can't call it a vision. I'm not a prophet. I, I don't have visions. Um, I don't know what to call it, honestly. A, a waking dream? <laughs> I shot up out of bed. It was 444 in the morning. And and my eyes are open and I'm awake. I'm conscious and I know that I'm awake. I can see the bed. I can see my bedroom. Um, but somehow in my mind, pictures were still being projected. Okay, so it was like I was dreaming, but with my eyes open while I was awake. If that makes any sense at all, I, I don't know. Here's what I saw, okay? I was on the Titanic, you know, the Titanic. And uh, I was on that, that ship with several thousand people. And there were three groups on the Titanic, okay? And there were two groups, and they were furiously fighting with each other, all right? And each group, you know, they knew that their way was right. And if they could just convince the other group that their way was right, they could somehow save the ship and prevent it from sinking beneath the waves. And the ship was going down. The water line was rising and the ship was getting lower. It was definitely sinking. And, and these groups are furiously fighting for control of the helm, you know, for control of the bridge. And the bridge was like barricaded and they were each trying to break in and, and fighting with each other to see if they could break in and take over the bridge and take over the helm of the ship. And, and they, they just knew that if their side was victorious, that they could save the ship and the ship would not sink. Um, but, you know, the problem is each side believed that they were the ones who had the answers. They believed that they were the ones who could save the ship. And, you know, so these two groups are furiously fighting with each other. There's a third group. And the third group, they knew that the ship was lost. They knew that it didn't matter which of the other two groups won or which was dominant. It would be a meaningless victory because whoever won, even if they made it to the bridge and took control of the helm, the ship was lost. It was going to sink no matter what. And so this third group they didn't waste their time fighting with anybody. They ran for the lifeboats. They were heading for the lifeboats, okay? And the interpretation was given to me. I, I somehow understood what all these metaphors, what all these symbols meant. Um, the first two groups, they were political groups. They were the Republicans, the conservatives, the right, and the Democrats, the liberals, the left. And they each thought they had the answer. And they each thought they could save a sinking ship. The third group, those were the people who, they pledged their allegiance not to a nation, an earthly nation state, like the UK or America or Russia or China, but they pledged allegiance to the Lamb of God and the kingdom for which he stood. They, they were the ones who, you know, the, the lifeboats were Jesus, okay? And they knew that you know, there's, there's no saving these earthly kingdoms. You know, this, this system, this whole Babylon system is doomed to burn. It, you know, these, these nations are doomed to be taken over and ruled by the Antichrist. No matter which way you look at it. And all political power will be his. All these nations, they will give their power to the beast. And the beast will rule them. And there's really nothing they can do about it. It's prophetic. Okay? If, if you believe in biblical prophecy, it's like having a history book from the future brought back into time. This is something that can't be changed. It will happen. And so, you know, the answer is not in a political group. The Republicans don't have the answer. The Democrats don't have the answer. The only one who has the answer is Jesus Christ. The Republicans don't have a Messiah. You know, contrary to popular belief by many Republicans, Donald Trump is not the Messiah. He's not Jesus. He can't save. All right? He won't save. Matter of fact, he is bound to, to follow the ways of this world as, as, a, as a ruler, you know, of an earthly kingdom. Joe Biden cannot save. He's not a Messiah. You know, the Democrats may believe Joe Biden's the Savior. Just 
in the same way the Republicans believe that Donald Trump is the Savior. Neither one of them are the Savior. Neither one of them are the Messiah. Neither one of them can save a single soul. The only person who can save a soul is Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. That's the only body who can, that's the only one who can save anybody, okay? So it, it doesn't really matter which of them wins in November in this election. I, I believe this, this waking dream or whatever you want to call it is a, is a timely thing. I believe it relates to the election in November. And it doesn't really matter who wins. And the way things are going, it looks like there could be riots whether Donald Trump or Joe Biden wins, man, there's there's severe hatred on both sides. In this country, America, the, the left and the right have never hated each other as much as they do. And uh, I, I want to tell you right now, I, there was a time I used to be political. I used to believe that if you got voted for the right politicians and you got the right people in power, that you could save the sinking ship of America. But I don't believe that anymore. You know, several years ago, God convicted me. I was reading Revelation, the part where he's talking about, you know, the harlot riding the beast and mystery Babylon. Not the old Babylon, but the new Babylon, the, the spirit of Babylon, the system. And, and God did not say, join a political party and fight for her, did he? No, he didn't. God said, come out of her, my people. That's what the scripture says. His command was clear. He said, come out of her. You know, because her sins have been piled up to heaven and God has remembered all her crimes. God said, come out of her unless you share in her punishments and her plagues. And so if I am disobedient to God and if I don't spiritually come out of this Babylon system and America's part of it, all the nations are part of it, if I try to fight for it, if I, if I try to do things in my own strength and my way instead of God's way, then I'm going to inadvertently bring those plagues on myself, those, those pestilences on myself. That was what God told me. That was what God revealed to me. And and he, he, you know, he told me, hey, I'm a jealous God. And, uh, you know, I, I realized that I had to come out of Babylon. And uh, this is a call to you, okay? I, I have some scriptures. I'm going to try to go through them quickly. To, to back this up, all right? I would, I would never tell you anything without scripture, and I would never want to go against the scripture, okay? Um, first off, and I didn't write this verse down, but do you remember the scripture where, where Jesus went to, to be a king? Um, let me look that up real quick. Because I can't even remember where it is. All right, John chapter 6, 15, right? Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Okay, our master set for us an example. Not even Jesus himself gave in to politics. Not even Jesus himself played this stupid game, all right? Do you remember when Jesus went into the desert and Satan came to tempt him? Do you remember the last temptation? Lucifer told Jesus, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you everything you see. All these cities, all these kingdoms, all the gold, all the wealth, all the political power of the entire world, it was given unto Lucifer because of our sin. He became a temporary ward uh, over the whole planet and, and all of its riches and wealth and political power. And he offered it to Jesus, if Jesus would just bow down and worship him. And some of you might think that Lucifer was lying and that was just a fake promise, but come on, don't you think that Jesus the Son of God would know if Lucifer were lying. And if Lucifer was lying and it wasn't his to give, how would that even be a real temptation for Jesus to resist? In order for God to be glorified, it had to be a real temptation. And Jesus had to truly resist it. And for that to be so, that means even back then, 2,000 years ago, all the politics didn't matter because ultimately Lucifer was the one playing the game. He, he, you know, he's the one playing everybody. He's the one that was presiding over the chessboard and using everyone as pawns. Your political party didn't matter then, 2,000 years ago, and your political party doesn't matter now, 2,000 years later. The only thing that matters is Jesus. Look at Jesus' example. Did he get embroiled in politics? 
did he allow them to to suck him into their their political you know their fight between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin and and Rome and no he said my kingdom is not of this world he told Pilate if my kingdom were of this world my followers would fight for me but but Jesus's kingdom was not of this world that was a fight he chose not to become involved in his fight was was more important his fight was higher than that on a whole nother level and a whole nother dimension so far above Satan's game, so far above the politics of man, which is Satan's game. That was where Jesus' fight was. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? But against principalities and powers. And Jesus understood that. So let me just read a few scriptures that have to do with this waking dream, if that's what we're going to call it. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. No one serving a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Did you catch that? So how can we get entangled in politics? That's civilian affairs. We're soldiers, soldiers of Christ. We're citizens of heaven. We're no longer citizens of this world. I don't pledge allegiance to a nation state anymore. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb of God and to the eternal kingdom for which he stands. I no longer pledge my allegiance or give my loyalty to nations that are going to burn up in the flames, to nations that will ultimately be ruled by Antichrist and, and a part of the great system of the beast that's coming on the earth. You know, we're, we're not of that system anymore. You know, we're of God's system. We're of Jesus's kingdom. We pledge our loyalty and our allegiance only to Jesus. We serve him and his nation there's no political boundary there. It's made up of every tribe and tongue and kindred and clan and race and skin color and gender and you name it, social class and culture and ethnicity. There are no boundaries. There are simply those who love and follow Jesus with all their heart and those who do not. Jesus' kingdom is, is a dimension and a level above any earthly kingdom. And we have to understand, if we're citizens of that kingdom, we have to start acting like it. We have to start living like it, don't we? Okay, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual uh, forces of evil in heavenly realms, right? We're not fighting flesh and blood. We don't fight with guns. We don't fight with bullets. We don't fight with bombs. Those kinds of weapons are useless against the enemies we fight. Demons? You can't kill a demon with a bullet. They'll laugh at you. They'll laugh at you in your face. You can't kill a demon with a sword or even a bomb or even a tank or even a nuclear weapon. You, just Come on, they're going to laugh at you. You can't fight a spiritual battle with carnal weapons. And that's exactly what politics are. Whether you choose the Republicans or whether you choose the Democrats, I don't care if you're an elephant or a donkey, you're going to fail. You know, if you could do this, if you could simply put the right people in power, the right political party, and pass the right laws and, and, and force people to do the right thing because, because of your laws and your regulations and your legislation, then why did Jesus have to die on the cross? Think about it. You know? If, if we could be saved by the law, if we could be saved by politics, there was no need for Jesus to die. We just need the right judges in the Supreme Court. We just need the right president. We just need the right people in Congress. And, and everything will be godly and holy and righteous again, right? Wrong! That's the way the Pharisees and the Sadduc uh, Sadducees saw that. That's the way the Sanhedrin thought. That's why they didn't understand when Jesus stood right before them. They didn't understand the time of their visitation. They didn't know that was Jesus. They could not comprehend it because they thought you could save by the law. They thought you could save by politics. They thought you could save by playing this pointless political game that never saves anybody or redeems anyone. Okay? Revelation uh, chapter 2, verse 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you left your first love. And that's what happened. A lot of people who loved Jesus with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, they left their first love. And they began to worship at the idol of politics, whether it was the Democrats or the Republicans. 
believing somehow that man could do what only God can do. Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by the means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? You see, those that's thinking that politics can change anything. That's thinking that politics could save anyone. It is utterly impotent. It is utterly Satan's game, no matter which side you pick. Come on. I mean, make America great again? Maybe. I don't know. But that's more nostalgic, wishful thinking. Because did America repent? Did America become more godly? Uh, more faithful in their marriages? Um, kinder? More gentle? Less violent? No. If anything, America's become more godless since that whole campaign started. People have become more violent, more angry, more bitter, more hateful. Um, they fornicate more, they, they, they drink more. They, I mean, there was absolutely no repentance at all in that movement, okay? That was not a God thing. That was a man thing, okay? And the arm of flesh can't save us. And nevertheless, Jesus has this against us. Did we leave our first love? You know, the church is the bride of Christ. We have a spiritual marriage covenant with Christ. So have we been unfaithful to Christ? Do we commit adultery against our spiritual husband by worshiping at the altar of politics? Do we try to do by the arm of flesh what can only be done by the spirit of the living God? Ask yourself these questions. Pray about it. Search your soul. Search your heart in these matters. Zechariah 4, 6. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Did you catch that? Not the arm of flesh, but by my spirit, is what God says. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 16. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. If you love power in this world... It's politics, it's political system, and the things that Babylon has to offer. You've left your first love, okay? And I continue reading from 1 John chapter 2. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, the boasting of man, what he has and what he does. Isn't that what man does? He's always boasting. Comes not from the Father, but from the world. Jeremiah 17, verse 5. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That's what happens when we are trusting in, in politics. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to give you scriptures for this. I, I, I want you to know I'm, I'm not talking out of my butt here. Okay? I'm not speaking frivolously. Um, I'm not making this stuff up. Okay? <laughs> Um, okay, very important. We have a historical example in Scripture, right? When King Saul was appointed as king over Israel with the prophet Samuel. Right? God sees choosing an earthly king uh, instead of him as rejection. God sees that as rejection. It makes God feel that we're rejecting him when we have to have an earthly king instead of him being our king. Okay? It, it's unfaithfulness. It's adultery. It is spiritual adultery and unfaithfulness to Christ, who is the spiritual husband of the church. We're the bride. The church is the bride. Jesus is the husband. And we are in a holy, it's a metaphor, it's symbolic, but we are in a holy covenant of marriage. And we are to keep faith with our spiritual husband. We are not to whore ourselves out to other gods or to idols. We're not to worship those idols. Because that is adultery, that is spiritual adultery, that is unfaithfulness to Jesus Christ. Okay? Well, we pledge our allegiance to the Lamb of God before we give our loyalty to anyone else. Okay, let's read 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 4. The people said to Samuel, Now appoint a king to lead us. 
such as all the other nations have, okay? But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, listen to all the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly, and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Did you catch that? God felt rejected. They rejected by choosing an earthly king, by choosing a political king. They are rejecting God as their king. So when we do that with a Joe Biden, or when we do that with a Donald J. Trump, I don't care which political party you're a member of, you are electing for yourself a King Saul. And you are giving your loyalty and your faithfulness to another other than Jesus Christ, who your rightful spiritual husband. If you're part of the true church of God, you're part of the bride of Christ, then you can only give your loyalty to Jesus. You must keep faith with him, okay? We can't leave our first love. Exodus 34, verse 14, Do not worship any other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. James chapter uh, 4, verse 5, Or do you think the scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? So let me reiterate, Jesus is a, the husband of the church, and he's a jealous husband. Did you know that? You being the church are part of the bride of Christ. That's the metaphor that's used in Revelation and all throughout the Bible. Both for Israel and the church, Old Testament and New Testament, God uses marriage as a metaphor to symbolize the relationship that he has with us. You don't believe me? Read the book of Revelation. It talks about how he saw this, you know, the, the city of God coming down, adorned as a bride for her husband. And, and fine linen was given her, pure and white, and it was made from the righteous acts of God's people. Okay? Read the entire book of Hosea in the, in the Old Testament. God commanded his prophet Hosea to go and marry a prostitute. <laughs> just to show, you know, Gomer. Just, so Hosea marries Gomer, a prostitute, just to show a, a metaphor or a symbol of what how Israel made God feel and their unfaithfulness to God. They were an unfaithful bride. That's the metaphor. That's the symbol that's always used both for Israel and for the church in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And when we turn to politics, when we turn to man and earthly leaders instead of God, God feels rejected. God is is hurt. He's incredibly jealous over that. So I want you to pray about this. I want you to search your heart. And if God tells you come out of her, you come out of her. You know, if you're in one of those two groups fighting for control of the Titanic, you need to stop. You need to join the third group and go find a lifeboat and get in it and get away from that ship and just come out of her because she's going down no matter who wins. The Antichrist is going to take her over and eat her up no matter who wins. You know, we're very close, aren't we? Aren't we very close to the time of the Lord's return? And look, I, I personally... I'm kind of a pre-tribber. Uh, I believe and I hope that we get out of here before tribulation, before the, the great persecution. But if you're not, we don't have anything to fight about. Because I don't. I, if, if you believe different, this is what I believe. I could be wrong. I could to be totally wrong. The, the reason I'm a pre-tribber, there's certain scriptures, you know, in Matthew 24, where Jesus says, some will be, two will be grinding corn, one taken, one left. Um, Okay, so I kind of believe that because I'm like, well, you know, these people were caught off guard. They were caught by surprise. But then he also said, he also said, you know, notice he describes all of those signs and wonders happening first and after these things. So you could be right if you believe different. I could very well be wrong and it could be a mid-trib or even a post-trib type of rapture. I don't know. I hope I'm right. Because I want to get out here as soon as I can. And, and I'm basically kind of a wimp. You know? I don't want to go through all that persecution and tribulation if I can help it. And I kind of hope and pray that, that the Lord would, you know, that we would be counted worthy to escape. Like when Jesus wrote the seven letters to the seven churches. Um, kind of hope that we would be counted worthy to escape and, and get out of it. 
But you know what? I could, I could be wrong and you could be right. And the point I'm making is it doesn't matter. Whether it's pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib, we have to prepare to meet the Lord. There are things we need to repent of. There, are, We need to get our heart right with God. We need to know Jesus in a personal relationship. We need to spend time with him, walk with him, talk with him. You know, we when the, whenever the rapture happens, we need to be sure that we know Jesus. And, and that's the important thing. It's not figuring out the exact date. It's not figuring out, you know, so many people have set dates and they've all been wrong. And I know maybe that discourages people or upset some people. I don't even think we're supposed to set dates. You know, Jesus could have told us a date in Matthew 24. He's the son of God. If he asked his father, his father would have told him. He could have told his disciples. But his disciples, they came to him and they said, Jesus, tell us, when, when's it going to happen? Jesus said, well, the angels don't know. And the son of man, not even the son of man knows. You know, he being the son of God. But only his father knew. And why? Why didn't Jesus choose to tell his disciples in Matthew 24? His disciples asked him. Did he not love them? Did he not think of them as his dear friends? Did he not care for their souls? I, I don't believe that at all. It's inconsistent with the character of Christ and who he is. But he didn't tell them because I simply think it wasn't a part of his plan for us to know the exact date. And it's not necessary. You're putting the emphasis on the wrong thing. When you try to figure it out by the strength of man, by formulas and star charts and and computers and uh, numerology and all these different, you know, that's that's like the arm of flesh, okay? And that wasn't the emphasis. If, if it was so important, that would have been the last thing Jesus said before he ascended, but it wasn't. What were the last things Jesus talked about before he ascended into heaven? What did he share with his disciples? He told Peter, if, if you love me, feed my sheep. So that must have been important. And what did he tell everybody else? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe all that I commanded you. That was like the last thing he said before whoosh, he went up to heaven. So that must be pretty important, right? And if we're busy about our Father's business, obeying the words of Jesus, Every day, living out Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those words that Jesus spoke out of his mouth, the words in red, then we can call him Lord, right? He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, if you don't do what I say? But if we do call him Lord, and, and if we do do what he says, then, then we can call him Lord. You know, we're, we're following him. I'm not saying we're perfect, but but we're following him. We're, we're trying to live our lives by his words and live the way that he taught us to. And then we have a right to call him Lord. Then we can call him master because we allow him to be our master, our teacher. You know, I I know it's kind of silly, but remember that movie Karate Kid, right? You know, Daniel, he had to honor Mr. Miyagi. He had to do what Mr. Miyagi told him to do in order to learn karate. You know, wax on, Daniel son. Wax off, Daniel son. If Daniel son had told Mr. Miyagi, Ah, uh, I don't need to do all that stuff you're talking about. You know, I'm just going to sit around and eat candy bars and 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 watch movies and, and sit on my butt and I'm not going to do anything. Do you think Daniel's son would have won the tournament? Do you think Daniel's son would have learned karate? No. And he would have got his butt kicked by those bullies and, and, and the outcome would have been completely different. The only reason Daniel's son learned karate and the karate kid is because he followed Mr. Miyagi. He did what Mr. Miyagi told him. He honored Mr. Miyagi as a teacher. He honored Mr. Miyagi as a master. He understood he was a disciple and Miyagi was the master and he was the disciple. Miyagi was the teacher. He was the student. Miyagi told him what to do and it was Daniel Sun's job to obey what to do. And because of that, he grew stronger and he learned the no can defense, you know, the crane and and all those wonderful things in the Karate Kid. But, but if he didn't call Mr. Miyagi master and lord, if he was not Mr. Miyagi's disciple, he would have learned nothing. Nothing would have changed. And don't you think it's the same way with Jesus? We're not talking about salvation by works. 
We're saved by grace through faith, and this not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works. So nobody can boast. That's what the scripture says. No, we're not saved. But what I'm saying is, how can we call him Lord, Master, Teacher? And how can we be disciples of his unless we follow him, unless we do what he told us to do? Understand? Okay. So lately, what's going on in the country? I want you to look at these things. Kyle Rittenhouse. Um, in the last few days, you guys have probably seen that in the news. He killed two Black Lives Matter protesters and, and wounded a third. I said second, but a, a third there. Um, Jacob Blake, shot in the back seven times. George Floyd, Dylan Roof. Remember the white supremacist who, who shot up that church and killed nine people in, in Charleston? Devin Patrick Kelly he killed, what was it, 26 people in Texas? I'm just bringing this all up because I'm trying to get you to see something. Jesus said there will come a day when those who kill you think they do God a service. These people actually consider themselves pillars of society. And their delusion, their deluded minds, they think of themselves as contributing members of society. As, as, as They justify what they do. They feel that what they do is right. Their hatred, their prejudice, their racism. And you understand where we're headed. No matter who wins the election in November, it's going to be a lot of angry people on either side. Whether it's a Joe Biden or a Donald Trump, doesn't matter. And what I'm saying is, you as a Christian, don't soil yourself, bride, with the affairs of this world. Your weapons are not carnal. They are spiritual. Don't you get involved in, in this fight, in this rioting, in this violence that's going to come, this bloodshed. Jesus called us to be peacemakers. We are to go around and show kindness and love, even to our worst enemies, even to those who hate us and despise us. Jesus said the whole world would hate us because of him. But let's make sure they actually hate us because of him and not because we're, you know, bigoted or prejudiced or walking around with loaded weapons, killing people, thinking that we're doing God a service. Do you understand what I'm saying? We have to come out of Babylon. Guys, either way, we're going to be hated and despised, but let it be for following Jesus if we get hated. Not for doing something violent or doing something bad. If anything, we should be the peacemakers, both to the white supremacists and to the Black Lives Matter protesters. Um, you, you understand what I'm saying? We're not of this world, and, and our agenda is not of this world. You know, their agenda is to get political power one way or another through honest or dishonest means. That's all they care about. They'll burn buildings down and they'll shoot people and they'll, they'll do all kinds of horrible things in the name of their political ideology. But that's not the people of God. Our agenda is to save souls. Our agenda is to reach out with the love of God to the hurting and the wounded of this world, whether they're our worst enemy or our best friend. Whether their political label is right or left, Republican or Democrat, or some other third party, or it doesn't matter if they're black or white, or capitalist or communist, or old or young, or male or female. Or, do you understand what I'm saying? Our agenda is not a political one. Our agenda is a spiritual one. Remember Jesus' example. His kingdom was not an earthly one. His kingdom is a spiritual one made up of every tribe and tongue and kindred and clan and nation and people unto our God. Hallelujah. Just please remember James chapter 2 verses 8 through 11. If we show favoritism, right? If we show respect of persons, the King James Version says, it's sin. It's wrong. Respect of persons, favoritism, that is prejudice. That's by nature almost a political party. If you join the left, you know, the, the, the right's evil. They're all fascists and they're right-wing wackos. And if you join the right, the left's all a bunch of libtards and snowflakes. By simply joining the party, I'm not saying don't vote. Vote your conscience. And in doing that, some of you might vote left and some of you might vote right. Don't judge your brother for that. Don't judge your sister for that, you know. Because it doesn't really matter who you vote for in the end. The arm of flesh isn't going to do it. The political party that's in power is not going to save the souls of man. Only Jesus is going to do that. And we need to stop selling Jesus out. We need to show the world that we're a dimension above. We're a level above politics. There are no political boundaries 
in the true church of Jesus Christ. Your political preferences don't even matter in the real church of Jesus because you understand, you know, if Jesus' kingdom was of this world, his followers would fight for him, but our kingdom is of another world. It's a dimension, it's an order of magnitude above earthly kingdoms. And, and our government, it's not a democracy. There's no voting, it's not a political party, there's no judicial branch, there's no executive branch, there is no Congress, no parliament. Our government is a monarchy. There is one true king, and his word is law. Every word that comes out of his mouth is absolutely the law of the universe. And we follow him without question. We pledge our loyalty and our allegiance to that one true king without question has nothing to do with these broken, corrupt, sinful, Lucifer-controlled earthly politics. Do you understand what I'm saying? I hope so. 1 John chapter 2, verse 11. Anyone who hates his brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. We can't hate, okay? And, and last but not least, I don't know why I'm adding this, um, I've seen a, a couple of shows on Netflix. I thought this one was interesting and I regret watching it <laughs> and I have since repented. But this, this show is so bad, the Church of Satan actually sued, I believe, Netflix for making this for defamation of character. Wow, that's somewhat comical and yet hard to believe that, you know, when the Church of Satan sues you for defamation of character and giving them a bad name, apparently you've, you've created something awful. But I had two particular shows on mine. This show, Lucifer and Supernatural. In this show, Lucifer, Lucifer is portrayed as the hero of man. You know, he's the one who's actually helping man. And his father, God, the one who created them, is perceived as a jerk. All right? And, you know, he says blasphemous things. But, but there's this theme running in society that, that Lucifer is the friend of mankind and God is the enemy. Okay? It gets even worse on this show here, Supernatural. That's another show. You know, Dean and Sam, and they go around. It started out they were just fighting werewolves and and uh, vampires and then demons and then fallen angels and whatnot. But in the last few seasons, they're fighting God. And the hero, well, you know, in that show, Lu Lucifer is just a, mis a poor misunderstood angel. And God is portrayed as an abusive father. Some of you have no idea how blasphemous these shows are, but... But millions of people watch them. They influence millions of people, okay? And uh, let's let's see what else is going on. The Antichrist, uh, who's named Jack, the, the son of Lucifer, he's the savior of mankind. And God is portrayed as a psychotic jerk who's out to kill everyone and destroy the universe. But the Antichrist Jack is going to save mankind from God, okay, by, by basically trying to kill God. or Blasphemous, I know, utterly blasphemous. And uh, I, I would never recommend watching these shows, but I think you need to know they exist. And I think you need to know what they talk about. And the reason I say that, there is a strategy. There's a, there's a hidden agenda in this world to get people to worship Lucifer, to see Lucifer as you know, a misunderstood good guy who's really trying to help mankind. And it's funny because it's changed what I believe. I, I used to believe at one time that the Antichrist would try to fake being Jesus. He would try to act like he was the son of God and, and fool everyone into thinking that he was the real Jesus returned. I honestly don't believe that. Seeing these shows and that they have millions of fans and millions of people like them. And if you read the comments on YouTube, they, they buy into this, in, in, you know, into this narrative of Lucifer being the good guy and God being the bad guy. I honestly believe when the Antichrist comes to power, he's going to tell people, hey, my father's Lucifer, but Lucifer is a good guy, and you should worship him, and you should pledge your loyalty and allegiance to him, and you should take his mark upon you, because God is the real enemy. I honestly believe he's going to do that. Why? Lucifer is the original narcissist. He's always wanted to be worshipped as God. And so what's, you know, it wouldn't be that if Lucifer had to deceive you into worshipping him, you know, I don't think it would satisfy his ego if if he had to trick you into thinking that you were still ultimately worshiping God. I, I think the only thing that will satisfy Lucifer's ego in the end is if people know who he is, if they know he's heaven's rebel, 
and they worship him of their own free will as God, and they take his mark for which there's no repentance and there's no going back, then I think his, his narcissistic ego would finally be satisfied. He would finally be like the Most High, or he would feel worshipped like the Most High. And uh, I, I don't know, just I don't even know why I'm kind of scatterbrained in this. I probably should make that another video. But, but the point I'm making is, is that we are living in these times and you need to know how close we are. Um, you know, people are being told literally, literally that God is their enemy and Lucifer is their friend. You probably didn't know that, did you? You know, and, and you need to understand how close we are. It's only a matter of time until God says, that's it, I've, I've had enough. You know, the clock is ticking and the film is rolling and the narrative has already begun. And, you know, revelation is underway. Bible prophecy is underway. Israel is a nation again. The fig tree is getting ready to bloom. And so my advice to you is come out of her, my people. Come out of her. And whatever happens this November, remember as the bride of Christ, as the church of the one true God, you were called to rise above that violence. You were called to rise above politics. You need to be a level above, a dimension above, an order of magnitude above Republicans versus Democrats. You need to understand this nation is the Titanic. It's going down no matter what we do, no matter who's in control. America's going to burn. America will be ruled by the Antichrist and eventually America will burn up along with all the other nations. The Bible says in fervent heat, the elements will melt and God will make a new heaven and a new earth. And the only kingdom left standing when the dust settles will be the eternal kingdom of Jesus Christ our Lord. And if you keep that in mind, then you won't be shaken by whatever happens in November. If you keep that in mind, you, you won't be terrified or paralyzed by fear, whatever happens in November. You'll be in the lifeboat. When the Titanic finally sinks and catches those other two groups off guard, you'll be safe. You'll be in the lifeboat of Jesus, and you'll be floating while the Titanic has slipped beneath the waves. Also, one more thing I'll share with you, and then I think I'm going to split this into two videos later. But I had another vision in 2016. This is right before the election, who won the election was announced, which when, when Donald Trump won the election. I stayed late for work one night. It was about 9 p.m. I was walking out to the parking lot. I was awake, but the parking lot disappeared and I saw a lake of blood. And there was a person on a horse, looked like an angel, or maybe one of the horsemen, spoken of in Revelation, the, the horsemen of war, but he was laughing, a demonic, evil kind of laugh. And, and the parking lot turned into this lake of blood. And in this parking lot, I saw people killing and attacking and fighting with each other. And somehow this happened in 2016. I think it was like November the 2nd or November... November the 3rd, I don't remember because I think the election was contested. But it was right before they announced who won the election. That's the night that I, I saw this, okay? But they're fighting in this lake of blood and somehow I knew it was brother against brother, father against son, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Just like Jesus said, a person's enemies will be the members of their own household. And I saw an American flag in the lake of blood and it ripped down the middle, okay? And, uh, I just, I somehow knew that it was a civil war. It was a civil dispute. And and the more these people, the violent they became, the more they punched and hit and kicked and, and shot and stabbed and killed each other, the more that person on the demonic horseman laughed. And I just knew that this was judgment from God on America. You know, one of the worst judgments that fell on the kingdom of Israel is when she was divided. Her kingdom was torn asunder. And, and Judah and Israel became separate nations or nation states and entities. And it weakened Israel tremendously because as Jesus said, a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. And that is God's judge, judgment on America that, that we too will be ripped in half, that we too will be at each other's throats, that we will be divided and weakened before our enemies, Russia and China, and they will come in like a flood. You better believe they'll take advantage of it when we fight each other. And uh, that was in 2016, that was that was a while ago. But it kind of goes with this vision of the Titanic and I guess just the central message is if you have put your trust in politics, 
Uh, I'll do another video too. I'm going to talk about Dana Coverstein and his dream, which goes along with this, but I'll make it another video because this one's already too long. I just want to encourage you, please come out of her. Please join that third group of people who's getting into the lifeboats. Don't be in those first two groups fighting with each other. It doesn't matter which side you choose. They're both going to lose in the end. The only people who are going to come out on top, literally on top of the water and not under the water sinking, are going to be the people who have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, who get into the lifeboat of Jesus Christ now, while you still can, before the Titanic goes beneath the water forever. I love you.